Well, when uh, basketball giant Charles Barkley, who now he is a sportscaster for the NBA, was asked years ago how he would handle his 12-year-old daughter's boyfriends, he replied, I figure I'll shoot the first one and the word will get out. <laughs> That's kind of the method I used, but it didn't work. Of course, Barkley was joking, I think. If you know Barkley, you really don't know if he was joking or not, but... I think he kind of describes how, as parents, we'll do anything we can to protect our children. Uh, Elisha was a man that requested a double portion of the Spirit from his predecessor, Elijah. And if Elijah was called the prophet of fire, then Elisha is called the prophet of miracles. So we've been studying this prophet, Elisha, for the last several weeks in 2 Kings uh, in uh, Second Kings, the first part of Second Kings, and what we see is just one miracle right after another. Last week we saw how he, God used him to multiply all so that he could provide the financial need for a widow and her two sons so that they could survive. And then today we're going to see a miracle in a family. And all of us have some kind of connection to a family. Either we have a, an immediate family uh, around us or we have some family, extended family, but all of us have some type of connection to a family. And so your family, like my family, from time to time needs a miracle. So that's what this passage is going to work on. I want us to look at 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to read the, it's a long story. I'm going to read the middle of the story to begin with. Then I'll read the first of it and the last of it as the sermon unfolds. So let's start with 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. <clears throat> it says, the child, now I need to un uh, explain who the child is. The child was born to a barren family. A family had been trying to have children for years. They were not able to have children. And then Elisha the prophet prophesies that they will have a child. And a year later they have a child. So that's the child in verse 18. The child grew... And one day went out to his father and the harvesters. Suddenly he complained to his father, my head, my head. His father told his servant, carry him to his mother. So he picked him up and took him to his mother. And the child sat on her lap until noon and then died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut him in and left. So uh, put him in the prophet's room in verse 22 she summoned her husband and said please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys so i can hurry to the man of god and come back again but he said why go to him today it's not new moon and it's not the sabbath she replied everything is all right then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant go fast don't slow the pace for me unless I tell you. So she came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her at a distance, he said to his attendant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite woman. Run out to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your son all right? And she answered, Everything is all right. Today, we need to ask the question that Elisha uh, told his servant to ask the woman, is it all right with you? Is it all right with your spouse? And is it all right with your children? And we need to be honest between us and God about those three questions. To look at this story from Elisha, and answer those three questions eventually, I want to look at three statements. The first statement is this. We are not guaranteed a problem-free family. Now, most of us in this room, if we are connected to a family, we understand that. That we are not guaranteed a problem-free family. That there are problems that come. There are things that cause great heartache to us. There are things that are devastating to us because we are not promised a problem-free family. I'm going to look, go to the beginning of the story and unpack this a little bit. In verse 8, I want you to see that money does not guarantee a problem-free family. If you go to verse 8, it says, One day Elisha went to Shunem, 
a prominent woman who lived there persuaded him to eat some food. So whenever he passed by, he would stop there to eat. Now, I want you to notice the word prominent. So this woman that we're talking about in this story that ends up having a child and the child dies, she is a prominent woman. She is a wealthy woman. If you read the story, it sounds as if her husband is a prosperous farmer or rancher in some form and that he is doing well financially. And though they have plenty of money, the money wasn't enough to buy them a child. They've been barren for years. Once they do have a child, the child dies and they didn't have enough money to buy the child back out of death. And though as much as we want money and we want the things that money can buy, the things that really give us joy in the end cannot be purchased by money. They do not have a dollar sign on them. And we know that because we look at uh, sports personalities that make millions and millions of dollars and, 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 and movie stars and singers that make millions and millions of dollars and yet their lives are so messed up, they have no joy, they have no happiness because you cannot guarantee no family problems by a financial means. And so that's the first thing I want you to see here. Jesus said in Luke 9, 25, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very soul? I want you to look at that verse on the screen. If you were to gain all the money in the world, impossible for us to imagine, but we would like to try for a minute. If we could gain all the wealth in the world and yet lose our soul for an eternity, we have lost. And so really, I want to ask each of us the question, how is it with you? And I'm not talking about your kids or your spouse. How is it with you? How's your soul? Are you confident that your soul is secure in a relationship with God? Are you confident that if something terrible were to happen today and you were to die, that you know that you would spend eternity in heaven? And you know that not because you have some self-confidence, but because you've done what the Bible says to do. You've committed your life to Christ as your Savior. How is it with you? Second thing that about problem-free family is religious generosity does not guarantee a problem-free life. So just go to the next verse, verse 9, still reading about this woman. It says in verse 9, Then she said to her husband, I know that, that, that this one who often passes by here is a man of God. He's a holy man of God. Talking about Elisha. So let's make a small walled-in upper room and put a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp there for him. Whenever he comes... He can stay there. So, so this woman has a generous heart. We don't know exactly what has compelled her, but she really sees that Elisha is a man of God. And when he travels by, she tells him to drive by and have a meal. And he's done that for a while. And finally, she says to her husband, why don't we just build an upstairs apartment for him? And put a little bed and a lamp and a table. And so when he comes by, he can spend the night and, and make his journey easier. I mean, she's got a generous heart for all the right reasons. And, and, and that's a great thing. And so you might think, well, if I'm generous to other people, then surely that will protect me from problems. Especially if I'm generous to the church or I'm generous to ministers, then surely that would protect me from problems. But that does not protect you from family problems. The third thing that doesn't protect us from family problems is previous blessings. Previous blessings do not guarantee a problem-free family. So let me catch you up on what happens from verses 8 uh, through 14. The woman had resigned in herself, in her own spirit, that she was going to be barren, that she was never going to have any children. We don't know how old the couple are, but they're old enough that they realize it's too late to have children. And so Elisha wants to do something for this woman. She first started feeding him, and then she's made this little apartment for him. And so she wants to, he wants to do something for her. And he, and he asks, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, you know, really there's not. Financially, I'm in good shape. I don't need anything. I'm living in my own country. I'm not like a captive in another country or anything like that. I, I don't really need anything. And she walks out. But the, the servant, Gehazi, says, they don't have any children. She didn't tell you, but they really want children. And they, they can't have children. So let's pick up the action in verse 15. In verse 15, it says, call her. Elisha said, so Gehazi called her, and she stood in the doorway. Elisha said, 
at this time next year, you will have a son in your arms. Then she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your servant. The woman conceived and gave birth to a son at the same time the following year as Elisha had promised her. So God uses the blessing of this child, and you would think if God is going to give you this blessing, surely there would never be anything bad happen to you after that. And maybe you've had a great spiritual blessing in your life. I mean, maybe, maybe it was a, from a revival experience in which God just uh, revived your spirit. Maybe it, it was from a men's or a women's fall uh, retreat and God just inspired you and revived you again. Maybe it was coming out of a camp, a uh, children's camp or a student camp, and God just revived you and think, well, surely now that I'm on fire for God, I'll never have any problems again. And yet, just because you receive one blessing doesn't guarantee that you won't have family problems, family crises. We are not guaranteed a problem-free family. That's the first thing to look at, and I probably don't have to convince you any more on that subject. Number two, families experience two types of problems. I'm reducing it to the simplest form. Families experience two types of problems. The first one is no-fault problems. Uh, you don't have to jot that down, but it just no-fault problems are those things that happen, and we, there's no direct connection between what happened to us and our behavior. It's really something that's happened, something bad that's happened to us because we live in a fallen world. We talked about that last week. Because of sin, we live in a world that is full of disease, disaster, and death. So that means you could get diagnosed with cancer and it not be your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. God's not punishing you. He's not trying to zap you. It's just we live in a fallen world where disease occurs. Disaster could strike you. And, it's, and again, it's not your fault. Your house could flood, and it's not your fault. Death in your family can occur, and again, it's not your fault. It's just the fact that we live in a fallen world where the consequences are disease, disaster, and death, and sometimes that spills into our laps, even though we're good people and godly people. It's no fault of our own. Jesus says this in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 45. He says, He, talking about God, causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and he causes he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous in other words that verse says good things happen by God's hand to both good and bad people it rains and the sun shines on good people and bad people and the reverse can be said as well that God permits the normal consequences of sin and a fallen world to fall on good people and bad people so there's no fault problems. There's no need to talk anymore about that because that's probably not our issue. Our issue is the second one, fault, fault problems. Things that are our fault. Now I'm going to mention three and you can just jot down whatever three you most struggle with. First, I'm going to call it family priority. And what I mean by that is that we prioritize family too much. You could almost say family idolatry. This is to place family above God. When Jesus taught about the cost of following him in Luke chapter 9, he, he talked about three different people that came to him and, and wanted to follow, and each one of them had an excuse. Two out of the three excuses used family members as their excuse to not follow. Family actually became an idol and stopped them from following Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whenever a family decides that its own interests are more important than the interests of God, and when a family decides that they're going to let the secular world dictate their calendar, their time, their budget, their energy, then they have turned their family into an idol. And, and though it sounds really good to have family values and to put emphasis on family, when family becomes more important than God, it actually is a problem. It's a fault problem of ours. Second fault problem of ours is family favoritism. Children often more identify with one parent than the other. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about where there is serious favoritism towards one child over, over the other. We know it happens. It happened to Isaac and his twin boys in Genesis. Rebecca favored Jacob over Esau. So what it takes is a special attention 
in which I'm going to build a unique relationship with each child. It's not the same relationship. You don't treat everybody the same because each child is different, but you treat them fairly and you uh, find a way to connect with each of them. Another way that this family favoritism is seen more often is when we try to live through our kids. Mary, who was the mother of James and John, tried to acquire favor favored status for her sons in Jesus' kingdom. She came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I got two sons. They're your disciples. Would, would you allow one of them to sit on the right hand of the kingdom and one on the left hand of the kingdom? She was trying to live uh, through her children. She wanted special uh, attention to her children. For, for too many, we try to live our frustrated dreams in sports and dance and academics we try to live our frustrated dreams through our children. And that is a fault problem. That is something we need to acknowledge that it is not healthy to try to live through our children. Another uh, fault problem is family apathy. This is kind of the opposite of family idolatry. It's where you don't prioritize your family. Apathy is to fail, to give enough attention to your family. It's to, ne to ne neglecting some specific responsibilities. On, on May 11th, the Kansas City Chiefs kicker, Harrison uh, Butker, gave a speech at a small Catholic college. And boy, it, it, the, the secular media got a hold of that, and they just didn't like anything he said in, in, in that speech. And especially when he said, women can find as much Fulfillment through getting married and having children as they do in pursuing careers. You would have thought that he had cussed everybody out or something. You'd have thought he had said something so terrible. In fact, the media called for the chiefs to fire him. Too good of a kicker, they wouldn't fire him. That's a little, little humor. Apparently, y'all didn't give it. That's okay. He really echoes information that has been coming to us for at least 25 years. 25 years ago in a Newsweek article, it said this, women have been fed a myth that our personal fulfillment is more important than having a family. Great satisfaction can come through healthy giving, supporting, and being a significant person in the life of your child. So I want to show you some ways that family apathy occurs. I'm going to call these specific responsibilities that we have. The first one is, is training and correcting children. That's the parent's job to train and correct children. There are verses throughout the Bible about that, but Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 9 talk about the spiritual, moral, and academic responsibility parents have for their children. J.D. Vance, in a more recent uh, data statistic, he gave this information. I found it to be interesting. In France... 0.5% of children are exposed to three or more maternal partners. Now, a maternal partner is a mother figure. So, 0.5% in France, the children are exposed to three or more mother figures. So, that would be like a biological mom, a stepmom, maybe another stepmom, maybe a, a, a parent, a, a grandparent, or an aunt that the child spends so much time with that it's almost like a mother figure. So in France, one out of 200 children in their rearing years, growing up years, are exposed to three or more uh, maternal uh, partners. In Sweden, 2.6. One in 40 children are exposed to three or more mother figures in the United States. 8.2, 1 in 12 children are raised with three or more mother figures in their life. That is, in their time, from the time they're born until the time they're 18 years old, they have been exposed to at least three different mother figures. You say, well, isn't it good to have a bunch of mother figures? Well, it's best to have 
the consistent mother figure, the same one over and over again. He also says, Vance also says in, in kind of that same uh, bit of information that he shares, he says, sociologists tell us that children raised in two-parent stable households are more successful. Now, he's talking about in an economic way. I'm not talking about in an economic way. And that is not to criticize single uh, single parents, and that's not to criticize people that have step parents and so forth. It's not. It's not to criticize at all. It's just simply to say that in in the way we function, we function better in success when we follow God's model. Now, sometimes sin happens, and sometimes junk happens, and divorce occurs, and there's step parents, and, and, that, and that's the way it is. We just have to deal with it and move on. But the best scenario is what God has for the same mom and the same dad with the children their entire life growing up. It makes a greater impact for success. A, another specific responsibility, so first, parents are to be parents. Another one is according to the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, according to Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3 and Colossians 3, 20. Obedience is the responsibility of the child. Sometimes I think we get that mixed up, but obedience is the responsibility of the child. Another specific responsibility is husbands are called to love their wives sacrificially. Colossians 3, uh, 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do, and, and do not be harsh to them. In uh, Ephesians, it says that wives are to uh, honor and respect their husbands. And so this is a relationship of the husband-wife. There's an entire book in the Bible, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, that is dedicated to the couple relationship. The rest of the Bible puts that couple relationship in the context of marriage. We're actually going to look at two of those verses tonight. So if you've never heard a sermon on Song of Songs or Song of Solomon come tonight, we're going to do the PG version part. We're not going to get to the R-rated versions of that. All the teenage boys are looking at Song of Songs right now to see what's in there. Yeah, we're, on, we're only going to do the PG version tonight. But it, it talks about the couple relationship and the bonding that they have to, together. Guy and I, years ago, we went to a, a marriage retreat and... Uh, in the marriage retreat, the guy was, he was talking and, and, and lecturing and so forth. He, and somewhere in the lecture, he made this statement. He said, every pastor ought to have an affair at least three times a week. And we just kind of, he paused and we paused. And then he said, with your wife. And all the men said, amen. So, that'll seek in a little bit later for some of you. Okay. So, we've got specific responsibilities that we are in charge of. So we see no family is problem free. We see that there's fault problems and no fault problems. The third thing to look at is that solutions to family, let's look at some solutions to family problems. Let me mention a couple solutions to family problems. First, there must be honest action. Now I want to go back to the verse that we read to begin with. I tried to emphasize it. So this is what happens. The boy who they've been waiting for all their life, finally he's born, he, he he grows up, he's in the field with his dad, he ends up dying. The lady goes, the, the, the mom goes to the husband and says, I need a servant and a donkey because I want to go see the prophet of God. And the, and the dad says, well, why do you want to see the prophet of God? It's not Wednesday or Sunday. Why, why are you going to go to church? And, and she says, everything is all right. Now, was everything all right? Her son was dead. Was everything all right? No. She hadn't even told the husband that the son is dead, and yet she says, everything's all right. And then Elisha sees her coming, and he knows it's not Wednesday or Sunday. He's like, something's wrong. Something's up with this. So he has his servant Gehazi run out to her and ask those three questions. Is it okay with you? Is it okay with your husband? Is it okay with your son? And notice in verse 26, she says, everything's all right. Could we just agree to say that sometimes it's not all right? Could we get to that point? That's the first step in family solutions is that there must be honest action. Everything is not all right. I mentioned this, I think, on Wednesday nights, but maybe I mentioned it on Sunday morning, several years ago. Diane and I asked five couples to come to our house and pray because everything was not all right. 
Now, if your pastor can do that, you should have permission to do that too. I'm not saying that you come to the front of church and tell the whole church. I'm not saying you stop someone in the hall who's a total stranger and start pouring your guts out to them. I'm saying there should be somebody, some Christian, that you could say, it's not all right with your family, with your kids, with your marriage. There must be honest action. Secondly, there must be urgent action. One thing the woman does do is she knows she needs to get to Elisha quick. So she tells the servant, I'm assuming the servant is pulling the donkey and she's on the donkey. I'm assuming that's the scenario. And she says, go fast, don't slow down, okay? She wants to get to the prophet soon. She, she knows, I need to get to the solution as quick as I can. Things don't get better on their own. You say, well, it's just a little marijuana with my teenager. It's not going to get better on its own, I'm just telling you. It's got to be addressed. You can't go months without intimacy and say, well, it'll just get better on its own. No, it's not. If there's a problem, it's not going to fix itself. It takes involvement. It takes intervention. There must be urgent action. There's a difference between what we call a covenant relationship and a contract relationship. We view marriage as a contract and children view the parents as a contract it's an inappropriate view a contract is based on this what's in it for me if I get what I'm supposed to be getting I'll say in the relationship if I don't get what I'm supposed to be getting I'm gonna break the contract because you've broken your end of the contract with parent and child it looks like this the parent, the, the, the parent invests and gives and gives and gives to the child. And then when the child grows up, they like don't have any time or interest in the parents. Because they say, I got what I wanted out of the deal. I don't need anything else. What we need is covenant relationships. A covenant relationship is, I'm going to self-sacrifice for the other person, not expecting anything return, in return because I love them. That's what a marriage is supposed to be. It's a covenant relationship. I'm going to self-sacrifice. If I don't get paid back or not, I'm going to self-sacrifice because that's, that's what God wants me to do. I'm going to do that with my children. I'm going to do that with my parents and, and, and uh, reciprocate it as well. So there must be honest action. There must be urgent action. And number three, there must be faith-based action. So in verse 27, the, the woman gets to Elisha, the man of God. Elisha doesn't know what's going on. He just knows something's wrong. Finally, she gets to the man of God and she says, why did you tell me I was going to have a child and let this happen? And Elisha finally gets it. The child has died. And the woman is moving towards faith and knows that Elisha is representing God and that Elisha can get some help for her. And sure enough, he does. And so we need to take some faith-based actions. Some of those things are, are praying even today, when my children come and visit me, when it comes bedtime, I'll say, you know, I don't ever get to pray with you anymore. You mind if I pray with you before you go to bed? They never say no. I mean, what are you going to say? You're not going to say no to that. Diane and I, for I don't know how many years, 30 plus, longer than that probably, I know how long we've been married. I just don't know how long we've been doing this. We'll get together in bed, and we will pray. She'll pray out loud for me. I'll pray out loud for her. It is something about hearing your spouse pray as compared to saying, I prayed for you. There's something about hearing that spouse pray for you. Ministering together in church, that's moving towards faith, where you do a Clear the Pew project together as a family, or you, you, you do some ministry together as a family. You seek godly counsel. You're not ashamed to seek godly counsel. And so finally, the miracle does occur. You can look at the end of the story in verse 32. In verse 32, it says, when Elisha got to the house, he uh, discovered the boy lying dead on his bed. So he went in, uh, closed the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and laid on the boy. He put his mouth to mouth, his eye to eye, hand to hand. And while he bent down over him, the boy's flesh became warm. Elisha got up, went into the house and paced back and forth. Then he went up and bent down over him again. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. 
He called her and she came. Then Elisha said, pick up your boy, pick up your son. She came, uh, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. She picked up her son and left. A miracle did happen because she did those things. She was honest in her action. She was urgent in her action. And she moved in the direction of faith. In 1998, Tara Lemsky was the youngest figure skater at that time in history to win the Olympic gold medal. She was 16 years old. The year before, she was the world champion. She was the two-time champion series winner in 97 and 98. In 97, she was the U.S. national champion. She was the first woman to complete the triple loop combination, her signature jump element, and, it, and she completed that in competition. That's why she won so many after the 1998 Olympic gold win, Tara Lemsky would not return to the 2002 competition. She was favored to win every competition after that. She was only 16. She had a lot of years left in her. But she said that the training was so intense that she felt like she was losing her family. She said this, If I return to the 2002 Olympics... I almost feel a little greedy in doing that, especially to my parents who have given up so much. I realized after the 1998 Olympics how important it is for me to be with my mom and dad and be all together and have fun and go out to dinner and really be a family again. To really be a family again. Or maybe for the first time. Ask yourself the three questions that Gehazi asked the woman. Is it all right with you? Is it all right with your spouse? And is it all right with your children? Now I want to spend a little time on each of those. First, is it well with you? You really can't fix your children or your spouse until you settle the issue, is it all right with you? I'm talking about the most important thing. Are you confident that you've given your life to Christ as Savior? I mean, how are you going to get God to help your marriage if, if you haven't even invited him into your personal life? How are you going to get God to help your wayward teenage child if you haven't even invited God into your own personal life? So is it okay with you spiritually? If not, we're going to sing a song here in just a minute. Ministers are going to be standing here to the front. I want you to come to one of the ministers and say, I need to ask Christ to be my Savior. That's where I'm at. Second question, is it okay with your spouse? Is it well with your spouse? Really, is it? Have you asked them? Do you dare Ask someone else to help in the couple relationship? And the third question, is it okay with your children? Is it well with your children? Not just children under your household, but grown children who can also cause a lot of heartache to us sometimes. Is it well with your children? For those number two and number three, when we sing, I just invite you to come and kneel at the front pew here or kneel down here at the front and and just tell God, I need your help, God. I, it's not good with my marriage. It's not good with my kids. I need your help. And the altar will be opened up for that. Jimmy's going to make his way and the musicians make their way as I pray. God, for each person in this room that has never committed their life to you as Savior, they don't look or act like a Christian because they're not one. Lord, I pray that they would see that they need to surrender control of their life to Christ as Savior. Lord, I pray that they would simply see they are sinners, that they cannot solve their own sin problem, and that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead as payment to cover up their sins so they could be in a relationship with you. And God, for marriages and for families, Lord, I pray that we would see there is no shame in surrendering those relationships to you. In fact, you desire for us to be honest with you 
and invite you into the marriage and into the parent-child relationship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.